Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. So today we are joined by former state senator Erica Smith, who is a candidate for uh, Senate in North Carolina. And we're going to talk to her and find out a little bit about her and her platform and what she wants to do. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, Bo. I call myself a dirt road Democrat. I grew up in the eastern part, northeastern part of North Carolina. I grew up on the family farm after my dad uh, served in the military, the United States Air Force, for uh, more than two decades. He retired, and we moved back home to the family farm in the late 80s and really, really struggled to hold on to that family farm. And so it's that hard work ethic that I gained from the family farm farm, harnessing the available resources to build a quality of life is what put me on my trajectory of um, serving and making sure that we are investing in community building. So professionally, I've been an engineer for 13 years. Um, after being an engineer for 13 years, I transitioned. I went on a mission trip to Uganda after I got my master's degree in religious studies. And I really became invested in placing service over self, understanding the capacity that we have to really build uh, and invest in the infrastructure so that all communities can thrive. So for the last 17 years, I've been a public school educator and ordained clergy. I was a party officer for 12 years, and then I started started um, in my elected service as a school board member for six years, and then in the North Carolina State Senate for three terms. Now I am endeavoring um, to take our voices and our values, and I say our a lot because we're not running a campaign, we're running a movement. We're running a movement to create real structural change so that our government works for all of us, not just the wealthy, not just the well-connected, but all of us. And so on that trajectory, we are fighting really hard to become North Carolina's next U.S. Senator. Wow. Something I didn't expect to hear and I don't have in my notes. You went to Uganda? Yes, I went to Uganda on a mission trip. And it was there in Uganda, um, I realized that, you know, we can send technology to Jupiter and back and every other planet, but we can't invest in that in developing countries beyond our border or even the rural parts of the state within our border. Uh, that coincided with me relocating back to North Carolina after uh, working for Boeing in Seattle, Washington, and also the United States Patent and Tra Trademark Office in Northern Virginia. I transitioned and moved back home because my dad had early onset of Alzheimer's and dementia. I went from doing high-speed research and um, internet research on two platforms to when I moved back home to the family farm, my parents were still on dial-up. It was incredible. <laughs> I had to suspend my graduate program. That's why I fight so hard. Policy is personal for me, Bo. That's why I fight so hard for universal broadband. I mean, we have entire communities who are disconnected from e-commerce, from remote learning, virtual learning from telemedicine because the broadband isn't strong enough. And so after that mission trip, I said, hey, you know, I want to really work toward community building. And I couldn't, you know, do that as an engineer. But being in the community, being a public school educator empowered me to be able to build coalitions and um, do a lot of work around, um, you know, creating that structural change, particularly for marginalized communities and those folks who have been left out, unheard and underserved. Wow. That's that's something else. All right. So you, you've been in North Carolina. You, you've been in government there. And now you're, you're going to the federal level. That That's yes. the goal. What are the uh, the main things you're going to want to accomplish up there? Well, we, we have three large buckets of priorities. The first one is to address the extreme income inequality that's existed in this nation. You know, this, this pandemic revealed just how rigged our economy is. When you look at having food lines further than the eye can see, Bo, but yet at the same time, we have millionaires and billionaires tripling, doubling, quadrupling their net worth in a pandemic. And so um, we're looking at 
so many rural towns that I've represented and even some pockets of urban centers um, that we travel, they've been hollowed out by <clears throat> monopolies and um, they've been left empty. And we have, you know, struggles to connect, struggles to have the infrastructure investments so that all parts of the state and the nation can grow. Uh, so that's why I've worked my way. You said, you know, from local leadership to federal leadership. I'm one of those candidates who understands, you know, the importance of a work ethic, but also gaining the tools and learning the rules and also paying your dues uh, and working that way from local elected office to state office to now congressional level office. Um, that's been, you know, empowering for us because we have built coalitions for the last 20 years of black, white and brown who are su very supportive and want someone who's going to fight for them wants someone who's going to place people um, over politics and prioritize people over corporate profits and prioritize communities over corporations. And they have that champion in me. That sounds wonderful. One of, uh, one of the things that I saw on your campaign stuff was the thing about rural health care. And I I'll tell you, and the people on this channel know that this this is an issue that that definitely touched close to me during the onset of the pandemic because i mean this channel helped go out and get like medical supplies for these hospitals because they just couldn't get them um I, i'm curious what what are some of the specifics on that like how do we uh how do you plan to address it because that is uh that's something else and i never realized how bad it was until the pandemic Yes, you know, and, and that's what it is. The pandemic revealed just how broken our healthcare system is that prioritizes profits over people. The reason why many of these rural hospitals are failing, and that's part of the income inequality bucket that we have, we also are supporting Medicare for all um, and then the Green New Deal. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But when we look at Medicare for all, we know that about 600,000 Americans died um, in this uh, pandemic. And uh, almost a third of them, uh, more than 200,000, died because they did not have health insurance or they were underinsured. And so what we know is that if we have the political will, we can provide health care for all. We saw a little bit of that by making sure um, we were fighting for people to be able to get tested, even if they didn't have insurance and did not have to pay and to be able to get that treatment. And so we can do it in a pandemic. We can do it as the one of the wealthiest countries on the planet and um, to be the only developed country that does not have a universal health care. There is a problem. This system is rigged, it's broken, and it's profiting off of a misery economy. I fight for Medicare for all because I believe that health care is a basic human right. No one should have to ration their insulin just to put food on the table. I have a personal experience. My family almost went bankrupt when I gave birth to a medically fragile son, and we had to get rid of our assets. Um, we almost lost our home. We had to get rid of the spare vehicle just for him to qualify for Medicaid Cap-C. And even with qualifying for Medicaid Cap-C, it did not provide for the life-saving health care that he needed. And so, Bo, you still started this question by highlighting how difficult it was to get resources to these rural hospitals. And it's because, you know, a state like North Carolina, these rural hospitals are closing their doors and they're suffering because we have not expanded Medicaid in North Carolina. And we are denying almost 600,000 um, North Carolinians adults who do not have health care. Many of them are working adults. And so, you know, it's a big problem. That's why I'm fighting so hard, but you are absolutely right. These rural hospitals are under-resourced, and, and, you know, anytime you have to drive two and a half hours, we were in Clay County uh, last night in North Carolina, and that's six hours from where I live, and, I, you know, I live in northeastern North Carolina, and when we uh, got to Clay, uh, we had a room full, almost standing room in one of the reddest counties in the state because people want someone who's going to champion those issues that are affecting them, um, them the most. And that's looking at having to drive two and a half hours from Clay County, either go to Tennessee, Chattanooga, or go to Asheville, North Carolina, in order to deliver a baby because all of the um, labor and delivery wards and wings are closing 
opening up these hospitals. They can't keep the doors open. And so we need to really, really look at how we can invest in making sure people have universal health care. We need to stop the profiteering by the pharmaceutical companies and the hospital CEOs. And we really, truly need to invest so that everyone can have health care. You shouldn't have to drive, you know, an hour just to get uh, medical services. All right. Now, everybody knows or at least has a general idea of what the Green New Deal is. I saw a red deal and a blue deal yes. uh, in your campaign stuff. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, the Blue Deal deals with the oceans. Um, I am an environmental justice advocate. I got my start uh, in the sixth grade. I live next door to Warren County in Northampton County. And Warren County was the birthplace of the environmental justice movement. Um, for those of um, you who can recall that there was toxic PCB dumping um, in Black communities and poor Black community in Warren County. And that was the birthplace of the environmental justice movement. That was when I gained my political consciousness to fight for clean air and clean water for everyone, um, and especially in communities that are um, underrepresented, like marginalized communities. The Red Deal um, is a, a strong deal that comes um, from a platform of understanding racial justice, particularly for indigenous people and marginalized communities. The Blue Deal focuses on clean water um, and our oceans. We have eno enormous problems in North Carolina with First of all, the flooding and the contamination of our groundwater from runoff from hog lagoons and uh, waste sites because these 500-year floods have been coming every other year in North Carolina because we've had extreme problems with global um, warming and we need to address this climate crisis with the bold initiative of the Green New Deal. For me, the Green New Deal um, is a strong and that it creates millions of good paying jobs, creating the energy system of the future. When you can look at these good paying jobs that will elevate families out of poverty, these are jobs that don't pay a starvation wage. They pay above um, $15 an hour. And so that's why we're really fighting hard for these strategic infrastructure investments that promote uh, racial, e racial um, reckoning with what has happened with marginal communities with the Red Deal, but also understanding the Blue Deal and the need to protect our water. Um, in North Carolina as well, I have fought as a state senator to address the issue of Gen X and emerging compounds fluorocarbons that are in our water and it's contaminating our water sources, um, especially when it comes to our military families. This is, you know, untenable and we have to fight for those who don't have a voice and who deserve to have a better quality of life. Uh, we need to clean it up and so we see the Blue Deal, the Green Deal, and components of the Red Deal as effective in doing that. Wow. It's going to be so fun listening to this because you talk so fast and I talk so slow. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, uh, I'm sorry. I have a lot to say and I try to get it in really fast. Um, no, as, it, as a teacher, we had to teach to a pacing guide and make sure we covered all the objectives for our students. So I've gotten a lot of practice in the last 17 years talking fast and getting all the information out. <laughs> no, it, it, it un I don't know if it's intentional or not, but it definitely shows you know your material. I mean, like there's no doubt. <laughs> about that you're, you're not reading it that quickly that's for sure uh, we've, been working, we've been we've been working on these issues for so long it, it's a part of our life story it's about creating a government that works for us i you know one of the things when i was going through getting ready for this i was looking at your campaign stuff and you you don't pull punches like it, <laughs> you know I, there was there's a line here it's uh our country exists on stolen ground, like flat out, boom, here you go. This is this part of it. We're going to go ahead and just throw this out here. And then you go in to talk about the, the Red Deal. Yes. Um, I'm curious with the current political climate, being that up front and just saying, this is what we're going to do. Medicare for all, you know, everybody supports it, but it runs into a lot of, uh, well, not everybody supports it, but it has overwhelming support among the American it does. people. It does. But, but when you get up to Capitol Hill, man, that, that's a tough sell. So how are you envision, envisioning doing it? I mean, I, you have state house experience. I'm just wondering 
I mean, that's going to be tough. <laughs> it's going to be hard. You know what? I, I'm I'm reading President Obama's uh, last book, and um, I believe there's a line in there that that um, David Axelrod shared with him that a hard thing is hard to do, or hard things are hard to do, and we recognize that this is hard. But you are right, Bo. The overwhelming vast majority of Americans support Medicare for all. Um, they understand its importance and um, taking the profits um, and making sure that you're investing them in the health and well being of people and not hospital CEOs and pharmaceutical executives. The reason why there's such inaction is because. Many of our politicians have been bought out by corporate interests. Um, they have been influenced by all of the corporate PAC money they receive from pharmaceutical companies. And so we, you know, we believe in calling a spade a spade and talking uh, truth and speaking truth to power. And that is our economy is rigged. And that rigging is perpetuated and continues because it protects wealthy. It protects wealthy people. It protects wealthy establishment politicians who don't want to upset the status quo and create the structural change that will lift millions of Americans out of poverty. And so to embrace another straight to the point, uh, straight no chaser concept is my role model, Representative Shirley Chisholm, who said you have to be unbought and unbossed. This is why, Bo, we are a campaign that's entirely uh, people-powered through grassroots donations. We have taken the no corporate money pledge, no fossil, no money from fossil fuel, gas and oil CEOs, no corporate PAC money. We only accept money from our only boss, and that's going to be the voters and the people of North Carolina and the people of this nation who want a champion who is not going to be bought off and not fight for the issues that we know will um, be effective in making sure that everyone has universal health care. It is going to be difficult to do, but there are a number of us now who are fighting for that. And I say that when we pull the progressives together who are fighting for this issue, um, many people, it's been easier to talk about um, Medicare for all after the pandemic. And we've seen, you know, what can be done. We also support UBI, universal basic income. No one could imagine before the pandemic that, you know, Americans could get a monthly check or a stimulus check to get through at hard economic times. And when we look at it, in every economic crisis, our government has intervened. They have bailed out the automotive industry, bailed out banks, bailed out corporate farmers. Where is Main Street's bailout? Where is the average working family's bailout? That bailout is a UBI. I, as a um, theologian, I follow Dr. Martin Luther King's teachings, and I know when he was um, talking about eradicating poverty, he said the best way to do it is through a guaranteed basic income. That is a monthly check. For me, our policy is $1,000 a month to every adult 18 years and older in this country, and it helps to work toward changing the socioeconomic status. When I talk about income inequality, it's about counseling student loan debt. Um, taking that burden that's been placed on the poor. The poor are paying more because of tax loopholes that we have in our IRS code, where the wealthiest are not paying their fair share. They can certainly afford that 1%, that 2% to make sure we can invest in those programs that are going to create that structural change, lifting generations out of poverty. This is a moral movement for us. We don't call ourselves a campaign. We are working to make our government invest in the people of this um, nation. All right. And as far as working class people, uh, I, when I was kind of digging into you, I know that's got to be weird to have people no. say that. Um, but you know, you went to uh, you went to college on a union scholarship, right? Yes. Yes. So I, I can assume you 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 support the Pro Act. 
absolutely, I support the PRO Act. Unequivocally, I support the PRO Act. And I see that um, in building the 21st century middle class. We can do that through strong union jobs. I've been a member of the union in every job where I have worked. It was because um, my dad, as a mail handler, after he retired um, from the United States Air Force, he um, we lost the family farm. We went in the red in the late 80s. That was very traumatic for us, um, particularly when my dad was suffering from PTSD. And then to have that burden, um, Black farmers were really left out in much of the USDA aid. And so we're fighting decades and generational fights uh, for equity. Uh, and so that's one of the issues that I wanted to highlight. But then he had to return to work to the uh, for federal service to the post office because, you know, he, he had to support his family. It was six children and um, my, my mother. And he did a phenomenal job making sure that we were taken care of. And so it was through his employment with the U.S. Postal Service um, that w my twin sister and I, it's six children. Four of us were in college at the same time. And so um, I would not have been able to go had the mail handlers local 305 not awarded me and my twin sister a financial aid and financial scholarships for us to be able to afford uh, to go to college. And so I'm very grateful for the impact that unions have had in building strong families and strong communities. I was a member of the union um, as an engineer. I was a member of SPIA, and <clears throat> which is... <coughs> a sub-organization of um, international machinists as, as a mechanical engineer for Boeing, and understanding um, how we can improve the workplace and protect workers through our unions. I, I definitely see the strength um, in the PRO Act and being really effective, particularly, especially as necessary to protect essential workers and workers who are coming back from a pandemic and need those protections in the workplace. Okay. All right. So... So I, you really did some research on me. Thank I you. Did. I did. I, I, I like to be prepared and I, you know, and like, I know the, the, the answer to the next question I'm going to ask. And this, and just for anybody else who's watching, this is like a normal viewer of the channel. This mm -hmm. may be like the only issue where you're like, wow, I don't agree with that. But I mean, nobody, nobody is going to agree on everything. So let's talk about gun control. <laughs> okay. you're you're in north carolina that's mm -hmm. that's going to be a hard sell i i don't have the specifics i know uh i don't have the specifics on what it was you're looking at and just to be clear if you don't know it's not like i'm one of the 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 far right nothing is out of bounds you can't do anything i was just uh i saw it as a bullet point in your campaign stuff and i was wondering what it meant what is gun uh, control for, to for you for me it's for me, gun control is common sense um, policies and legislation to protect innocent people from being harmed um, through gun violence. We've had an enormous uptick and increase in gun violence across this nation. Um, there have been so many mass shootings, more sh mass shootings than we have days of the calendar year, and something needs to be done. I am for, um, common, let, let me lay this out this way. First, let me share with you that hunting heritage is, is very important in my family. I grew up in the rural part of the state. I have one of my sisters who is an avid hunter. Um, she prefers steel hunting. I have taken the concealed carry class myself. I have not yet um, purchased a, a, a gun, but I um, support that common sense legislation that many, many, the vast majority of gun owners support. And that is um, making sure that you're banning assault rifles. Um, when we go hunting, when my family family members go hunting, they don't hunt with an assault rifle. If you've got to hunt with an assault rifle, then you don't need to be hunting. And so we, we look at um, banning assault rifles, bump stocks, rapid fire, ammunition, at least putting a limitation on that. Universal background checks with the adequate waiting period. If that's 10 days, then it's 10 days to make sure that you are not allowing anyone who should not own a gun to fall through the cracks. Uh, red flag laws that um, will be provided to keep individuals and uh, gun owners safe um, when they should not have a gun because of mental incapacitation or because they're sick or um, other challenges 
places that for periods of time would not make it safe for them to have a gun or safe for the public. And so these are common sense issues, common sense policy and reforms that um, many, many Americans support. And so that's what gun reform and gun policies, um, common sense uh, protections for our community. Okay. I believe well, that we we can use the advancement of smart gun technology for um you know for for all of those occurrences of children um getting access to guns when they shouldn't because people are not always following the protocols and the rules but I know that in this 21st century we can look at some innovative strategies like smart gun um technology to prevent people from being harmed um from from you know unsafe practices. Well, in, in many ways, gun owners are their absolute own worst enemy from not doing the stuff that they, they should do as far as securing firearms and stuff like that. But one thing that I, I have to do, because it, when I anytime I talk to anybody who's going to have any influence, when we're talking about gun control, please, please look into um, – closing domestic violence loopholes they yes. are like these loop there's laws on the books but they exist with a whole bunch of loopholes and when you look at the statistics that is absolutely going to be the most effective thing um yes and and that's something that it seems like it, it should be on somebody's national platform and i don't i don't see it very often <laughs> um so honestly i agree with that fully yes when, when going through your your entire platform, that was really the that's that's the hard question. Like for for the audience that you're going to be talking to, that that's that's the tough one. Everything else is definitely in line with what most people watching this channel believe. And to be honest, it's probably fifty fifty on on the guns. Um, so when it comes to student loan. Um, it says canceling student loan debt, right? Yes. That, that was the thing. Now, how is that going to work? Um, is this a, a thing where we'll end up with federally funded universities or are we just talking about what's incurred and try to reset everything? Um, we're talking about what's incurred and definitely reset. That is a start. When you look at student loan debt, it unnecessarily and um, it, it has a disparate impact on poor people and minorities. Um, as Black women, Black women are one of the most educated demographics, but they carry the highest um, in student loan debt. And so when I'm talking about canceling student loan debt, this is a tool that will help lift generations out of poverty. You look at the ways that people were able to build wealth in this country. Um, if you were not born with a silver spoon or didn't come from a family with money, um, you had to get a college degree in order to earn in higher salary brackets. Um, that is unfair when you have generational poverty that's our, that are systemic holdovers from uh, Jim Crow, from segregation, um, from um, slavery, African slavery in this country. Uh, as a black woman, Bo, let, let me share this statistic with you. As a black woman, I only earn 62 cents on the dollar of a white male. And so when my earnings are capped because of uh, systemic discrimination and inequities in pay across genders and across demographics, then you're placing me in a further hole of poverty. Um, and then when, when I Loans, and those student loans are because my family, you know, doesn't, doesn't have the generational wealth to just write out a tuition check. Then you're adding layers of inequality. So I believe that one of the most um, uh, structural ways that we can impact uh, lifting people out of poverty is to cancel student loan debt. 
that is a start. And so beyond that, I do believe that there should be um, free community college and we need to look at some of our state colleges and making sure tuition is as low and um, as affordable as, as possible. But I am for counseling student loan debt and I am for um, a form of free college uh, for so many students because I believe what Nelson Mandela said, a Quality education is the greatest civil rights tool of the 21st century. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so coming from a, uh, a postal family, what do you, what oh, do you think? Oh, I didn't know that we shared that in common. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I was, I was just wondering what you think oh, of the, oh, the pre-funding oh. mandate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I you were saying you're from a postal family as well. Um, I, I believe that the this pre-funding mandate, this is why this is what has led to the US Postal Service um, getting into such extreme financial problems and hardships. We don't require that for any other um, governmental entity. And so we, we need to remove that. I also am supporting a policy that's postal banking. In many of these rural communities, as I shared earlier, the banks are closing, their banks are closing their doors. Um, one of the biggest issues that I get from seniors that I talk to is that they want face-to-face -face banking. They want personal banking. They don't trust the internet. They don't trust, um, you know, those who can get a broadband connection. They don't want to do those transactions online because of identity theft and um, the issues around cybersecurity. And so I feel that it is a win-win. Every town that we travel through has a post office. And so we are promoting a policy that talks about postal banking services, and that will be a way to add the additional services and have the increased um, 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 the, the the increased operations for our postal service. It's it's a wonder it survived in the previous administration with the attacks um, on the postal service, but I see that as the, two things, postal banking, but also this pre-funding requirement, um, we should end that and we should look at ways to strengthen our post office because it is a life-saving tool in many of our communities across this um, rural state in North Carolina, but also across this nation. Yeah. So for listeners overseas, um, yeah, you know how y'all can go to the post office and do a whole lot of your banking needs. For some reason, we don't do that here in the U.S. <laughs> I mean, this this is standard in a lot of places. It, it can't um, be done. It's being done. Why not it, do more of it? Yeah. I mean, that that that's it, it's one of those things that the facilities are there and they're trusted people because of having to handle the mail. It, it seems like it would just go hand in hand. Just uh, makes sense. Yeah. So when it comes to your platform, I think we've gone over most of it. Um, is there anything you want to get out? Um, I, we, we've talked a lot about the PRO Act, but I also want to stress um, a $15 minimum wage as the floor. If it were indexed with inflation, it would actually be $22 um, around that neighborhood per hour. And I just see that raising the wage, people are trying to survive off of starvation wages. Um, there's a lot of discussion around this time about, um, you know, businesses not having workers. And I don't think we have a worker shortage. I feel like we have a wage shortage, Bo. And, you know, people, the problem, if people are getting paid more, um, $300 a week to stay at home, then the problem is, the starvation wages that people have had to uh, be faced with. And a lot of workers have not been able to return because they don't have the money or they don't have access to childcare. And so those are issues as a working mother. Um, I, I had to pay <laughs> when, when I first started out, my children were young. Um, when I was working as an engineer, I, I had a, my, my two sons, my older sons are two months apart. I mean, 15 months apart. And even even with their age difference, you know, I was paying eleven hundred dollars a month in nineteen ninety three, ninety four. Eleven hundred dollars a month in childcare loan. So I never really saw my paycheck, Bo. It just circulated through the local economy. <laughs> That's all right. I did. And so, 
<laughs> when you look at the cost of child care, uh, that's really important for us. And so um, we will be sharing, you know, our policies. We have a series called Policy is Personal. And for me, having to navigate these broken policies is why I fight so hard, because I know that um, the, the, you know, the status quo that disenfranchises so many groups of people is only been the status quo because there's been no one to look at at re-engineering those policies so that they work more effectively. They work as well in the rural pockets as well as the urban centers. And some of the work that I've done as a state senator, the district that I represented became less economically distressed because of um, re-engineering those tools for structure strategic and targeted economic investments um, in, in investments in infrastructure. And that's how you do the work of elevating communities out of poverty. So I hope that people will go to our website, www.ericaforus.com. We are truly one of us for all of us. We are one of us who will fight for us and one of us who will champion um, we are the only progressive in this race, Bo, and we are the only ones offering a platform that is big enough, that is bold enough to solve the problems that working families are facing, um, not only across the state, but across this nation. And so we would like for you to learn more about us, go to our website, do your research, invest in our campaign. Um, <clears throat> we don't take money from corporations and corporate PACs, but I guarantee you, if you don't invest in politicians, um, that you want to support who are championing our causes, then corporations will will, will um, have their way and buy all. I think I'm losing you. Speaking of broadband internet in rural areas. In Okay, are you back? Okay, we are a People Forest Movement, and we're looking forward to representing millions of Americans in um, the U.S. Senate. We know that together we can do this. Thank you. All right. Now, one of the uh, one of the cool things, if for those that are that are wanting to to check it out a little bit further, on her website, the the platform's actually there. You know, we talk a lot about policy and and actually having a platform to stand on. It's all listed. You can go through each item and, and kind of take a look. Um, now, are, are are you still there? Or have I lost you completely? Well, this certainly shows the uh, importance of the broadband internet in rural areas that she was talking about. Um so I guess that's going to be the end of the uh, <laughs> of this interview. <laughs> so uh, anyway, she's running in North Carolina, and uh, go uh, go check her out. Anyway, it's just a thought. Y'all have a good day.